McGuire's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry McGuire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug if you haven't already. Fastest men on earth, Craig Breedlove, whose quest for the land speed record has spanned more than five decades. We'll also take a look inside Dr. Paul Roller's revolutionary sky car. If this isn't car crazy, I don't know what is. So stay tuned. Can you imagine strapping yourself in front of a jet engine and driving down the road at 600 miles an hour? Now that's car crazy. And this is Craig Breedlove who's actually done it. Capturing the ultimate land speed record has been the goal of many an adventurer. And of all the flamboyant figures that have pursued the record, none have advanced the cause or made a greater impact on the record book than Craig Breedlove. Craig is the fastest American on land. He was the first man to go four, five, and 600 miles per hour. When he was only 12 years old, he hitched a ride with some older boys up to the legendary Bonneville Salt Flats. It was hot rod heaven. Craig's interest in aeronautics helped him land a job at Douglas Aircraft, where he learned about rocket and jet engine vehicles. Well, Craig, you are one of only five people in the world who have ever gone over 600 miles an hour in a car. How did it begin? It probably started with actually a love of model airplanes. Um, growing up I had a workshop in the back of my parents uh, property and was kind of a loner kid and I just um, had a real affinity to get involved in things that were aesthetically pleasing to me which airplanes were and uh, then of course the mechanics of it and then the dynamics of flight. That uh, led me to uh, uh, an interest in hot rods actually. It, it starts to make sense now that your love for aerodynamic design and hot rodding came together all at once in this wonderful racing career that you had. Oh yeah, I mean I, I went to Bonneville with some of these older friends that were in hot rodding in 1952 I think. Just you know the aerodynamics of those cars and my background from model airplanes and my understanding of, of the aero part uh, it just um, married together in this fascination and was, the light bulb turned out. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as far as uh, your affinity for planes and so forth, then you went to work for Douglas Aircraft, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, right after uh, high school. First I worked for Bill Murphy Buick for a while and then uh, went to work for material and process engineering at Douglas Aircraft. We tested airplane structures, wing spars, uh, various materials, uh, some rocket engine parts, and it got me a, a real understanding of uh, metallurgy, uh, the fatigue and structural properties of building things out of aluminum and, and out of uh, diff all different types of materials, and you know what, uh, what was good design, what was not. So I, I got a good education from Douglas Aircraft. So you finally get around to building your first land speed record car out of Air Force scrap in your father's garage, no less. But I understand you had a little bit of a problem with your neighbor. Tell us what happened. We knocked all the steps off the house 
and we we could there was only one solution we had to cut down Tuchin's hedge oh, you know no. <laughs> so we thought well we have to strike fast because <laughs> and and Tuchin will be so happy that the car's going that he won't <laughs> protest really yes yeah, just get out of here. Just so out of here. Uh, God it was a, you know we got the the chainsaw from Sam's <laughs> rental and I mean it took us about three seconds to go through Tuchin's hedge <laughs> of course he was in flight off the upper belt and he coming down <laughs> as the hedge was falling, and uh, I, I can remember just saying, but "Mr. Tuchin, the car's going. The car's yeah, going. I just remember, keep says, that in mind. <laughs> it's gonna go. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'll put the hedge back, Mr. Tuchin. Okay. Nice boys. <laughs> Your initial land speed record attempt at Bonneville in 1962 was unsuccessful. But then you returned 1963 with a new tail for increased stabilization and finally broke John Cobb's 16-year-old standing record by posting an incredible two-way average of 407 miles per hour. Well, then your success spawned a host of competition, and none more famous than your rivalry with arch nemesis, Art Arklund. I remember between 1963 and 64, you and Art kept trading off setting records. It seemed that Art was always waiting in the wings every time you made a record run. We were standing by, that's why we were in Vegas. We had booked the following week on Assault, so we were just waiting to see what he was going to do. And uh, when he broke the record, we loaded up that night and was back on our way to Bonneville. The world was fascinated by the two of you guys. You became good friends through all oh, this, yeah, and yeah. so now you're you're driving back from having been racing, and what? you're you're in your rental cars. Uh, well, what we'd done, we'd go, we'd gone to dinner at Park City, so you know we're coming down the hill, and and so Art nails it, you know, at the stop sign in your, and in your rental cars, <laughs> in the rental cars, and so down the hill we go, and of course we get pulled over by a cop, and and uh, the Art was in front, and I was behind him, and. And the cop went up and, and said, who do you think you are, Craig Breedlove? Because <laughs> we've been on the front page of the newspaper yeah, every day every for day, or months. Know, months. And so Art didn't say too much. He just handed the license out, you know, to the guy. And the guy got it and said, Art Arf. And he said, oh, my God, I, Art Arf. And he said, I had no idea. And he says, well, wait till you can see my dad who's in the car and back. <laughs> so. There was one day when you didn't have as much fun as others. Uh, the, the great accent that has been chronicled and shown in television, yay, barely a thousand times. But uh, can we go back and set the stage for that day? Uh, that, uh, all of us who watched that have to wonder what was going on in your mind at that point. Yeah. But it kind of set the stage for us right quick. We decided we would go for 500. And um, the uh, suspension, we had had some help from some uh, control systems engineers at, at Hughes uh, Helicopter, and they, they had uh, designed some uh, bolt setups to hold the front suspension in, in the car, and it, it was done by 5 16 aircraft bolts, wh which are in double shear. When I was making my return run, I went 513 going down in the morning, uh, turned around, came back, and had a one of those bolts shear and it sheared in the uh, two links that control wheel camber in the front end and it allowed the wheel to to just lean over inside the front end of the car it just happens to be the wheel that steers yeah the oh car. your front that was my nose <laughs> wheel right yeah so uh you know of course i my initial reaction was i had to board to run but i found out by getting the steering wheel turned up and upside down i could steer into this cambering wheel <laughs> And by then I could see the timing lights and being on the backup run, you thought, well, you know, maybe yeah. I can make this. And just hit 565 coming out the last light and I went, whew, made it, you know, fired the parachute button and nothing. So I went, ooh. <laughs> uh -oh. So then I fired the button for the emergency. I heard the powder go off and nothing. At 500 and some odd mile an hour, heading for a 12-foot wide bridge, it must be a pretty small target. <laughs> oh, it, yeah, it's, it's a small target. I mean, I went past the starting line I'm like this. <laughs> and uh, anyway, over the bridge. Went and across the bridge. <laughs> across the bridge. Right. And, and uh, then, then the object was to see if I could make a U-turn to, to gain more distance because beyond the bridge then was another dike with no bridge and a big embankment to go over. And as I 
got into this thing, I couldn't turn as hard as I wanted to, so I, I just did it to the maximum. And unfortunately, I started to hit some shallow water that was on the ground at the foot of the speed course before it reached the dike. And then, uh, you know, the, the water got deeper as, as we approached the dike. And of course, it, it had more and more braking uh, capacity. And it did get me slowed down to a little over 200 when I hit this embankment. And also, I was running fairly parallel to it. So rather than a direct blow, I had a kind of a glancing blow. And the car went up on a 45 degree angle, cleared the top of the dike, and the um, right rear wheel fairing just clipped the top of this embankment, which rolled me level. Now you're airborne. Yeah, no noise. I mean, it's real quiet. <laughs> and uh, for some reason, I said, Craig, you better get the canopy out because if these pins, if you bend the car and the pins Ooh. freeze, you're not, you're going to be trapped in it. Oh, so man. I reached up and turned the um, uh, latches for the canopy and pulled the pins. They came out real easy, and I just bumped the the canopy up, and it, the air just took it out of my hands. And I hit the water and it skipped one time like a rock. And then the very next time when, the, when it hit the water, it just grabbed it and, and sucked it down. And then you pulled yourself out and said? Well, yeah, I said, for my, for my next trick, I'll set myself on fire. We'll talk about Craig's next trick, his quest to break the sound barrier when Car Crazy returns. Nothing is so appealing or more seductive than the aerodynamic forms of land speed cars. But it's the bravery and ambition of their drivers that we love to celebrate. More than 35 years after breaking the 600 mile per hour barrier, Craig Breedlove has come out of retirement in order to regain his title as the world's fastest man in a car. Craig, you couldn't be any more famous. You've been there, you've done that. You're 30 years older. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Why would you want to sit yourself in front of this jet engine and go six, 700 miles an hour? I, you know, I, I don't know. I ask myself <laughs> that all the time. But really, I mean, it's just the excitement and the interest of doing it. I mean, I, you know, uh, basically just being car crazy, I guess. I mean, I, you know. It, it, I've just never done anything in my life that I was that involved in. I mean, the intensity of, of interest and the amount of, of uh, focus that it takes to do something like this um, just really heightens life. I mean, it, it really does. It's a very intense thing. It's, it's an enorm enormous amount of work, but you're, you're alive, you're living every day, and, and um, I, I guess, you know, I mean, I just miss that uh, kind of intensity in my life, with, the passion. With, with all of your yeah. other successes, I guess everything is just boring compared to <laughs> this incredible thrust of speed. And well, that's, that, that's, that's right, and, and, and you just, you miss the passion. Now you have the new spirit of America, and I'm yeah. going to say, yeah. just sitting still, it's amazing to watch it and look at it. Yeah, it's an incredible car. I mean, it, you know, during all of this time of business and everything, and, you know, my mind is drifting off, fantasizing on how I would build the next uh, Land Speed Spirit of America car. When you look at the uh, engineering equation of what makes one of these cars go really fast, it's, it's basically having low drag. And, and um, a lot of people wonder why we would choose a single engine design because the new British car is a two engine car. This generation, Spirit of America, you get in and you're in a whole other world now as far as speed. I mean, this thing is, is smoking. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, our nemesis, Great Britain, uh, showed up with uh, half the Royal Air Force and, and uh, you know, an, an enormously well-funded uh, uh, program and um, uh, uh, an, an amazing driver, Andy Green, who is a squadron commander. And, and, they, and they, they were able to go 763, which is right at Mach 1. There's some sensational pictures from an ultralight airplane showing the, the uh, shockwave spreading out across the desert as the car came toward you. And, and there it was a very visual impact because it lifts the dust up. And you can, I mean, you can just see the shockwave. I mean, it's painted right coming out from the car as it comes to you. So we had to, you know, kind of... Uh, 
swallow our pride and uh, just take our lumps. I mean, we've been through the crash uh, from 96, which incidentally, uh, you know, talking about uh, but, you know, the fear of God, I mean, uh, you know, the, the uh, crash uh, uh, back in, in 1964 is, was, was uh, you know, qu quite a thing and everybody remembers that. But yeah. in 96, I put the new car up on its side at 675 miles an hour and I mean, man, I, it was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, oh my, <laughs> and it wasn't, I didn't say oh my either. <laughs> but um, we think we have a faster car and we, we're pursuing it and uh, trying to, to uh, raise funding to do this. And the uh, plan now is, is uh, to go in, in 2001. We had hoped to go this year uh, in 2000, but didn't raise enough funding to go. It's, it's not inexpensive. Well, Craig, this has been great, and uh, it's so nice to capture this for our viewers so they can really hear what it <laughs> is to be genuinely car crazy. Uh, we know the money's going to come in, and next summer you're going to be out there rolling. You're going to make that record. We can't wait to be there at Ruchion, and uh, it's going to be just a lot of anticipation between now and then, and we really wish you well. Stay in good health. <laughs> Stay health, healthy, and um, uh, we'll look forward as this whole story continues to unfold and have another incredible time with you as we did back in the 60s. To do that all over again with Craig Breedlove is something I just can't wait for. Yeah, I can't wait either, Barry. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, and uh, we're going to bring her home. Yeah, I believe that. I believe that. Don't you, folks? <laughs> we'll be right back, and don't go away. We have a lot more coming. Welcome back to Car Crazy. The dream of significantly improving the state of the art has been a dream of many an inventor. The Wright brothers, Henry Ford, Preston Tucker, and today, Dr. Paul Moeller. It is Car Crazy's privilege to introduce you to a true visionary. Dr. Moeller has spent over 40 years of his life and $50 million to make his early childhood dream to fly like a hummingbird become a reality. His dream has landed him, excuse the pun, in Davis, California, developing his unique car, plane, motorcycle creation. He calls it the Sky Car. Paul Moeller's credentials speak for themselves. He holds a master's degree in engineering, a PhD in aerodynamics, and was a professor of mechanical and aeronautical engineering at UC Davis for 12 years. From the early 1960s, Dr. Moeller has been fine-tuning his multi-use vehicles with some success. Early models took on the appearance of your typical UFOs, with multiple engines surrounding the two-passenger cockpit. In 1989, his M200X Skycar made its debut. It has made over 200 successful flights, bringing recognition and credibility to his endeavors. Another of Dr. Moeller's inventions is the Aerobot. The Aerobot has proven his theories and is being put to use by the military and various other government agencies. The latest version of the Sky Car is the M400. It is the sum total of all he has learned about motors and aerodynamics. It uses principles similar to that of the British Harrier Jump Jet, redirecting thrust, enabling it to hover, take off, and land vertically from almost any surface. It will cruise at 25,000 feet, reaching speeds of 350 miles per hour, and it can carry up to four passengers. Dr. Muller describes his unique creation. I would describe it as an aircraft that drives for convenience. It's a rotable aircraft uh, because it's so it's theoretically so capable in terms of getting around like a hummingbird. Why are you going to spend any time on the ground with all this miserable traffic that's there? So you're going to spend 99% of your time in the air, so I would call it a, a rotable aircraft, something that can be driven from your home electrically to a vertiport, which may be within a few blocks of your home, perhaps even a few miles, and then you take off vertically and uh, fly. It's got kind of characteristics like an Indianapolis race car. It's got similar weight and similar horsepower, so one can assume that it has similar acceleration capability. The M400 was designed with multiple redundancies so that flying one would not only be a simple task, but a safe one as well. The best way to do this is put in a number of engines so that one engine can fail and the vehicle can continue to operate. Never allow any single component to become so critical it can cause the failure of the aircraft. 
That was our driving force behind this. And right now, you cannot find anything on that aircraft that if it failed, uh, the vehicle would crash. We have designed the engines to burn any fuel, and that's one of the unique features of our rotor power engine, is that we can run on diesel, alcohol, kerosene, gasoline, or recycled oil from McDonald's french fries. There is virtually nothing that we can't use in this engine. The design of the M400 is part of its greatness. Every aspect of the body was constructed with a specific purpose. Well, I would argue, as history has always argued, that form follows function. You go into a wind tunnel and you try to make the vehicle low drag and very efficient and it takes many hundreds of hours, even thousands of hours, until the configuration sort of evolves to a metamorphosis into this final configuration. And when the vehicle ultimately goes very fast, it also looks pretty good. Stay tuned for more Dr. Moeller's Skycar. Welcome back. The M400 has yet to take to the skies, but Dr. Moeller is confident of its eminent success. Of course, as many people are going to say, you never fly, you're crazy. At the, but actually, it's amazing. It's, it's, not, it's, it's more likely to be a corporation. The head of a major corporation is going to say that than it is uh, some engineer, a young engineer, or uh, somebody who isn't inhibited by what we can't do rather than what we can do. And, the, and I think in today's world, where if you can imagine something, you can almost guarantee it's going to happen. There's nothing that's going to prevent this from happening. And it was sort of like, you know, why not? I mean, I always felt I could do it, and nobody was saying to me, you can't do it. And that's a tremendous asset in life. So, so I think I was very fortunate to be in the environment I was in. And I was certainly fortunate to have the parents I had who uh, allowed a number of things that very few parents in the world would have allowed during my experimental phase. I don't consider myself an entrepreneur. I've only been an entrepreneur to get to this goal. So I had to build products to sell. I had to develop real estate. But what I'm really doing is, is this one relatively narrow obsession, one might call it. Certainly my wife would say so and prefer that I would spend my money in some other way. Uh, but at the same time, she's supportive of the ultimate goal of making this happen. I see this taking the place of those inconvenient trips that we now get involved with the automobile. And that's typically the longer trips that, that end up in bottlenecks somewhere along the line. That miserable experience that I go through every time I go to San Francisco. That I, I've got to the point that I don't want to go to San Francisco anymore because of it. If you come into this world for whatever reason with this obsession of some sort that you wanted to do something, uh, you're a bit possessed. But I don't know that I would call it possessed as much as I would call it, and I have often used the term, following your spiritual covenant. That's really where I put myself, is I've got something here that I'm fulfilling, and uh, to the extent that I can fulfill it without making life miserable for myself or somebody else, I'm trying to do it. Well, that's all for now. This is such a treat for me to share some of the great people of my life with you. Hope you've enjoyed as much as we have, and I hope these stories will make you just a little bit more car crazy. Thanks for watching. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the Meguiar's family of appearance car care products. Meguiar's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.